So it says to her, it says to her, right? Yeah. Sanctum. Damn near built him! <laughs> <laughs> Never gets old. Oh man. Oh. <clears throat> oh. Oh. Hey. I'm uh, I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim, and we're talking arcane sanctums on WebDM. This episode is sponsored by World Anvil, the ultimate world building platform for GMs and writers. Join over 150,000 DMs and storytellers, organize your world, create interactive maps and timelines, prep your sessions with the campaign manager, and run them with the digital DM screen all for free. Use the voucher code WebDM for up to 15% off guild membership, which offers tons more options. Link and details in the description. We're also excited to announce the Tower of Power competition. Create your Arcane Sanctum on World Anvil, and the writer of our favorite entry will win awesome prizes, including loot straight from us. More info in the description. Let's pick out a place, um, because you promised. Oh. And we could, uh, we could build something special. Oh. Let's build our own little WebDM Arcane Sanctum. Oh, okay, right, yeah, sure. The summer home can wait. The idea of a mage's tower, yeah. right? The tower in which uh, a bearded wizard with their stars and moons hat mm -hmm. and robe, uh, you know, retreats to to ponder the mysteries of the universe. Pretty classic uh, trope in fantasy, right? You, you know? can't change reality without doing a little bit of research. Ooh. And you gotta have a place to do it. Place to, hold, to hang your hat. Right, <laughs> towers feature, uh, you know, heavily in, in fairy tales and sort of myths and legends. You know, at some point they get mixed up with the, the archetype of the wizard, the caster, the, the court vizier, yeah. uh, you know, that kind of thing. And, and towers and magic and, and the like seem to go hand in hand. And it's one of those things where in your games, in your home worlds, you know, you might like, yeah, you know, it's a wizard's tower or, or whatever, you know. You don't put too much thought into it. Hand wave it or really just kind of present only one type of wizard's tower. Then thinking about your, you know, the sanctum sanctorums of the world, the, mm -hmm. the places of power that the casters retreat to to work their mighty magics, those locations where supernatural forces come together and great and wondrous things are, are possible are a, a step above just the, the lonely stone tower uh, that has a, a crotchety old uh, wizard, you know. Yeah, I mean, why just uh, make a regular tower when you can create a demi-plane in between the heartbeats of a yet-to-be-born god? Yes, yeah, exactly, you know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, you might need that kind of space for the yeah. sort of magic that you're working, right? Exactly. Majocracy, you know, a, a place where magic confers, like, rulership or authority, mm -hmm. then maybe the, the tower is a... Uh, you know, a physical symbol of that in the same way that like castles were in medieval Europe. A, a projection of power, a physically imposing space that, mm -hmm. that says something about the person that lives there, that says something about their authority and their majesty and their magnitude. Some would call it a fallacy. Oh, right. sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you have uh, the chance to imbue those things, yeah. which in our own world were just symbolic, with like real magic. You right. know, a, a place that has power. You would construct something there to make use of that power that confers something magical and, and has a long history in D&D, &D, right? Birthright mm -hmm. setting is, is, a, is a game where, you know, your ability to rule and be a, you know, a figure of authority is based on a certain type of magic. You can kind of take that and say, well, what if it was, uh, you know, the ability to, to work miracles and spells that, you know, gives anybody a reason to listen to you. Therefore, the places where they live and, and do their magic would be different than just something else. So it's, mm -hmm. Like I said, we're thinking about. Well, let's start talking about those places where they live. And the first thing is going to be location location, location, where where do you build this thing? Where indeed, right? Mm -hmm. and In just any old glen or any <laughs> old hill? I, yeah, I would say absolutely not, right? Yeah, like right? In the same way that, uh, you know, a, a castle is strategically located to project power and, and be physically imposing and also serve as a place of sanctuary, you might look at the magical geography of your world and think, uh, you know, these are the locations where towers, sanctums, uh, lairs, and, and other sorts of uh, places, dwellings the, that your casters would uh, inhabit that they're going to be. Um, so they might be, say, planar confluences, right? Mm -hmm. We always talk about, uh, you know, the, the walls between worlds being thin or the, the membrane of dimensions, that kind of, the, the idea that the other world is, is just right there on the other side. Maybe it's a, a stretch of swamp where anyone can see ghosts. The power of necromantic energy is strong strong there because the link to the underworld is very close. It bleeds through into this world or, or any other number of other planes that could influence the prime material, right?
right? Oh yes. Uh, I'm I, I'm thinking like if you were at one of the absolute poles mm. of the planet, if you could be, right? Uh, there would be something very connected to uh, either either uh, the planes of order. I don't know. Just that that kind of geographical symmetry. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Does your world have just regular ley lines? Yeah. Um, just these these threads of of energy that that thread the landscape. Right, and they could be they could be tied to the schools of magic, right? Mm-hmm. You could say like, yeah, the ley lines sort of enhance certain schools or certain types of spells. If you're using uh, the sort of like the spell tags that um, you know certain online tools provide and sort of like ways to organize your magic in your world, then you could say like all summoning magic maybe is enhanced by this particular type of ley line, and therefore confluences of ley lines where it's like summoning and divination and blasting and like those would be significant locations in your world and Mm -hmm. maybe they're like fought over and who has access to them and and which uh, caster controls that location is a matter of politics and intrigue and backbiting yeah and i mean anytime you take you start investing uh you know investing something in real estate (laughs) you up the stakes of things Mm -hmm. and you you know you you make uh, enemies people are going to be upset that's uh, something that you took that's denied to someone else and so Mm -hmm. Uh, any number of places could be up for grabs like this, right? Well, also in, in that same regard, uh, you want to build a tower somewhere and maybe you found a place that no other wizard had figured out, right? Right, right. But you are in the lands of this other kingdom and yeah. you have to deal with more mundane territory. You're like, no, 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 I want to build a tower over here. Yeah. They're, they're going to be able to see it. Right. Like, so you, you got to beseech the king or the landowner or whoever right. and, you know, Always purchase political. the deed, you know? exactly right. Like or political concerns are yeah. like that, right? You know, you can't just uh, come here and, and, and build something, you know, um, and so you can like complicate matters like that, and then maybe uh, having access to these places of power becomes. Uh, a, a matter of geopolitics, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and just something that the kingdoms and, and nations of your world engage in and consider as their war aims and part of diplomacy. Yeah. The world of Razzle Sin is much like this. I, I sort of took a, the idea of ley lines and was like, all right, there are these currents of magic over the world. And some places, say the island that Razzle Sin has her hut on, is, is one such place. It masks. Uh, you know, people in the same way that like a non-detection spell would and, and enhances illusions and things like that while you're on the island. There's an entire empire of mages who recognized this uh, pattern across the world and began building cities and, and places that they would come together to work their magic and slowly over time had a network of these. Mm-hmm. And, and instead of it being one that's tied to say the physical geography of the world and say like, I don't know, like the Roman Empire is like a frogs around the pond of the Mediterranean is one story put it. This is more about the magical geography of the world. And if you looked at it on a map, wouldn't wouldn't really make sense. You'd be like, man, that part looks really difficult to defend, or yeah, yeah. why in the world would you all be clustered here? Yeah, yeah. It's all about the magic, right? And they have a continent-spanning uh, empire based entirely on where the ley lines are. Or what happens when the magical confluence is like a thousand feet in the air? Right. Yeah. How do you get there? How do you build something? Yeah. There? Do yeah. you do you have to talk to the cloud giants now to mm-hmm. like do a do a whole thing? Or yep. are there some air elementals you could summon? Yep. Do you build a thousand foot tower? And yeah. the only part that's magical is literally the very top. <laughs> it's just everything else is just a really long leg right. just to get up to just that to one spot. <laughs> but once you do, it's going to be epic. Right. And maybe there's like, uh, you know, stories and legends of all the attempts to make harnessing the power of this place work. You know, this is the part where as storytellers and game masters and world builders, we break out of the normal mold with these places. You know, if you're using something like a game system to help create your world or, or to present it, you have to abide by certain rules sometimes, or at the very least, you know, you're expected to. You know, your, your players might say like, oh, well, you can't always just make things up or, or they want justification for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, having places like this lets you say like, well, the normal rules don't apply here. Something's different. Yeah. Uh, and, and whether or not you're basing it on a planar cosmology that influences the place, the a past history of something, maybe a, a, you know, a tragedy occurred there and certain oh, yeah. types of magic now are, are more heightened, right? Like, oh yeah, like, history a, like, of a, place like an stuff. epic battle. I mean, we already like think, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, that certain battlefields are haunted, but yep, what yep. if they're haunted with the vestiges of the magic that was used there? Oh God, I mean, yeah. I know that's a big part of 
land between two rivers. Yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> literally yeah, the whole land. Literally the whole world is, is kind of like that. And so yeah. you have like living spells. And, and if it fits in, say, the Mornland in Eberron or would fit in, say, Dark Sun, then it probably has a place in, in Land Between Two Rivers. And, yeah. and those are places where magical, uh, you know, devastation or just destruction has absolutely destroyed the place. And maybe your place of power is it reflects that. And it's yeah. a desolate wasteland because it's constantly racked by violent elemental energies that scour you know mm -hmm. the, the the land or the opposite it's a verdant forest in an otherwise you know kind of lifeless place and maybe that signifies that there's a link to say the Feywild there or yeah, just the, spilling out yeah just spilling out or, or like particularly fertile soil because it's coming straight from elemental earth and, and you know it's full of its you know whatever it is in your world that makes plants grow you know was the side a place where a great spell was once worked and now uh, it, it impacts the location maybe Maybe a particularly hard-fought battle in your own campaign that happened, say, at you know, mid-levels or something, becomes one of these places. And speaking of the Lamb Twenty Two Rivers, uh, we had a character uh, perish in a battle there, and where they were buried has since become a place of, of peace and sanctuary. In part because of spells that were cast uh, when the character was buried there, but also because it just makes sense for the character. And they were a druid. They were a tenth-level druid when they died. You don't have that kind of power; it just doesn't go away. It, yeah. it, it stays with you, and it would influence the place. So holy sites, uh, tombs, maybe the graveyards of magicians are secret places because their magic doesn't go anywhere. It, it stays with them. Mm -hmm. And you, you don't want that just lying around. Uh, so, you know, all of these things you can use to create a place of power and then like alter the rules of magic in your world. I mean, that's just the start of this though, right? Well, yeah, I mean, you gotta start ground up. So now we start moving up or move down. Maybe you wanna go underground. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, but what is it? What's its purpose? Power. Right. You're right. Mm -hmm. Like, what are, what are we doing here, Jim? You know, you found a location in your world, uh, yeah. you know, cliff tops with shrouded by fog and cloud and the violent energies of air and earth. You want to, say, experiment with some spells that, that deal with those conflicting elemental energies, and so you build a location there to experiment. Or maybe you want to use those uh, winds and, 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 you know, rock slides and the like as a deterrent because you just want some peace and quiet. You know, like mm -hmm. what you want out of the location or what rather what the creator wants out of it uh, is going to say a lot about um, how it's built. Is this a, a, the, a country villa of a, a court mage who, you know, likes the, the peace and tranquility uh, of this place that it masks prying eyes. It just has a, a soothing effect on them, but it's not a fortification. They're not doing like in-depth spell research here, but it is like the abode of a wizard mm -hmm. or something like that. So it's magical in and of itself. That's very different than the sinister skull sorcerer who, you know, weaves necromantic rituals atop the obsidian tower, you know, <laughs> over oh, the yes. cliffs of acid kind of location, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's different, obviously. Oh yeah, <laughs> but much different. My, my wizard would totally just, would build a tower on top of the peak, just the peak of the mountain. Yeah. That's all his tower. Yes. Maybe like a dwarven wizard like that. Right, right. Like from the outside, it doesn't even look like anything mm -hmm. suspicious. But inside, if you were able to see, it's riddled yes. with workshops and foundries and, and mm -hmm. for all the rune smithing that they need to get up yes. to. Yes, building a race of atomic super dwarves. <laughs> <laughs> you need and then we will rule the world! You that kind of cavern space. <laughs> yeah, that's for you, Trap. Anyway. So, uh, research libraries, um, a collective, uh, you know, we're assuming a single uh, occupant and, and uh, you know, creator, but maybe this is like a cabal of mages or something oh, that yeah. come together uh, for a particular purpose and have built a structure for a particular purpose. Or a place like, say, Candlekeep, right? Like Candlekeep in the Forgotten Realms, you could easily take that concept, move it to your own, and, and say, like, this is a magical library. The fact that it's a magical library turns this entire location into a place of power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, clerics uh, and priests of gods of knowledge uh, attend here, and, and, and getting entrance is a grueling and, and demanding task. But once you're here, you have access to, you know, the spirits of sages who, who still live here, or, or maybe, you know, the, the temple of the god of knowledge, like, they'll, it'll actually come down and talk to you and answer questions. If you're it's a 7 a.m. class. It's right. early, but <laughs> it's, it's really worth early, it. Really early, early. <laughs> yeah, um, it's the god of knowledge. Just remember, so. you got that uh, research paper is due on Tuesday. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just Day. What you do with the place and how yeah. you uh, present the structures there is going to tell a lot of the story that you want to tell and, and more importantly like how it's used. 
Mm-hmm. You know, if this is for a game, it, 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 you're creating an adventure location that your players can run around in and, and potentially change things. So it's worth thinking about, like, how's this place laid out? What's the point of it all, right? Yeah, just start with just an example we've talked about before. Uh, my character Aristides the Unblinking, the Diviner, we mm-hmm. took that uh, that castle in, in the mirror of, mirror of Dead Men mm-hmm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. It was just an observatory with a telescope, and it's like, my guy just had an existential crisis with killing people when he's a, not, when he's a Diviner. <laughs> so he's like, you know what? This is a good place to sit down, put down some roots right and uh and and that was perfect like it yeah. became his wizard's tower and our headquarters yeah. and it became all of those things right 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 it's sort of like it sort of organically grow you like take over another location which is a, another thing right like you're repurposing a, a structure that's originally built for something and, and probably has been repurposed several times so yeah. Being able to like tell a story through how you present a location is a skill that you can learn as a, a dungeon master because it's a better way of doing it than just like info dumping or um, you know like I, I, yeah this place was great here's what you know about it through this spell or this sage versus letting them go there and discover and see how it you know all fits together like the second occupant in this place made changes to it from its original function or something like that it's a way of showing rather than telling yeah. and a way of like imparting a sense of wonder into the location yeah the big thing for me with structures and and uh, fantastical settings and worlds is this concept of sacred geometry Right, mm. of there being a, a type of architectural magic that you can engage in. And if you think of, uh, of things like uh, runesmiths and the like, then the idea of uh, objects being spells or spells being cast into objects, it's not that much of a stretch to then go like, well, why not buildings? And if not buildings, then why not arrangements of buildings? Mm-hmm. And if like a magic circle, if viewed from above, is an arrangement of certain glyphs and, and patterns and you know, in a certain way, then perhaps uh, buildings and walls and features of the landscape that have been shaped could also make an arrangement that uh, channels similar magical energies. And now you start thinking about the fact that, say, the arrangement of rooms in a location might be a spell in and of itself. Yeah, or the, really weird, and nobody right. knows why. <laughs> or designed to disrupt spell magic, right? Like uh-huh. the interior of uh, the the bar in the Dresden Files, right? I forget his name now, but the way that the mm-hmm. interior of this pub is laid Machinalis. out. Machinalis. Machinalis, right. To you disperse know, magic To energy. disperse magic. Mm-hmm. And, and perhaps there are, you incorporate all of these things into your, uh, your place of power in mm-hmm. that the entrance and places that need to be guarded are like magical baffles. It mm-hmm. just it's just difficult to to practice magic there because of the way everything's laid out. But the closer you get to the mage's sanctum, magic becomes actually easier and more powerful and focused because this arrangement of walls with carefully embedded spells and runes and the materials that they've used to build it uh, channel the magical energy to their you know, casting chamber, which, you know, the air is electric with it. And all of those are, you know, different ways to incorporate this idea of, like, the building as being a spell Mm -hmm. or being part of the magic of it. Yeah, just woven into it. Woven uh, into it, yeah. Like Dresden's at the top of the hill in the island in the middle oh, of sure, Lake yeah, Michigan, yeah. Demon mm-hmm. Reach, I think yeah, he calls yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it was supposedly, it's it's laid with spells. Yeah. And, the, and that's what you're going to want to do, right? I mean, like, you're going to be wanting to put your, your this is where you want to put your glyphs of warding. This is where you oh, want to yeah. put all your, your guards and wards if you can get it. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, how you kind of lay out uh, the, the the geography. Yeah. But different wizards are going to approach it different ways. Uh, yes. And we'll, yeah. we'll get to that in a bit. Oh, sure. We'll eventually, we'll eventually be but, talking about these casters, yeah. But um, the spells are a part of the place, though, right? right? Because a lot of these spells are, particularly if we're talking about a game like Dungeons & Dragons, you know, you cast them every day for a certain number of time, then become permanent until dispelled. And so if you've got a place that's changed hands a few times, that's been, uh, or, or, or just like been occupied by the same person for a long time, then there might be old magic lying about, spells that were laid a long time ago that have had a time to wear and tear and fray or or even weirder things, right? Like become self-aware. In Dungeons & Dragons, it's built on the idea of, of Vancey and magic, which is that ma- spells are living things that a, a caster traps in their mind, you know, sort of like releases out into the world. Then if you follow that, then spells are wild things that you don't just want to be 
leaving around unattended no. all the time. That's why you got to cast that thing every day, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Keep it uh, in line. You might find that uh, you know if, if your wizard's tower, or arcane sanctum, is uh, you know abandoned, that the magic has gone wild and frayed, and coupled with the natural magic of the place, these spells that have been uh, laid into the architecture and the, the you know the, the entire structure of the place might behave differently and might um, you know, not work exactly the way, say, you know, the player's handbook spells work or, or something mm -hmm. and might be in something else entirely. Or yeah. it could change the way that the people exploring it practice magic mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, and, and maybe you could do a thing where you don't have to cast at the entire amount of times to you know, bring it to heal. Yeah. But, you know, for a certain amount of time, maybe you have to tend the yeah. spells a bit. Yeah. Strictly like Dungeons and Dragons, the, the counter spell mechanic is a good sort of benefit for this. Like, you just have a caster check, right? Uh, you know, it's 10 plus the spell level. And, you know, just a quick caster check. You know, do you make it? Do you not? Uh, and, and that's a good way to sort of model that sort of difficulty. Otherwise, you know, whatever system you're using, you can, you know, impose some kind of penalty or something. But I think it's a good way to reinforce that these places are not normal. Mm -hmm. And they're not just like a regular location. There's something different about them. Yeah. And worthwhile thinking about how magic and spells also fit into the structure of the place. Uh, but I'm sure. Um, yeah. We talked about, you know, how to build them, how, yeah. how you're going to build them. Sure. Because also, I mean, hell, you can just build them with certain spells. Oh, for one. So right, another yeah. thing worth mentioning. Yeah. You know, that's like the, what is it, uh, instant fortress or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you do that. There's you, like can, you can literally just build your whole tower how you want it. Ooh, yeah. Or you could, like, maybe the place is, like, you summon the structure, right? Mm -hmm. Like, the, the whole point of being at this place is that you activate it, and there's, like, now the structure forms sort of around you. It's summoned into being yeah, yeah. Uh, when you're there. But yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, you got to love a good disappearing structure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And the sun comes up <laughs> and fades away. Um, but you're also going to want to populate that thing, uh -huh. right? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, some wizards might be okay with just being the only thing bumbling around their 30-story tower. Sure. But generally there's there's usually there's usually something moving around in the halls doing things. Usually, uh, yeah. There's you know. a little homunculi and familiars. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of like the inhabitants of the place, first off, are they the original occupants? Like, yeah. Are they supposed to be there? Are they squatters or invaders or something like that is mm -hmm. a consideration. But like, let's assume they're uh, you know, they're on purpose, right? right? Brought there by the creator of it. Then it's like, uh, are they guests? You know, is this someone that the caster or mage has, has you, know, you know, I want you to be here and we're going to talk about, you know, something diplomatic or uh, work on research together. Maybe they're a family member or something. Um, mm -hmm. You can get really sort of weird with this and depending on how powerful the caster is, you might have like time lost guests or, or creatures from other dimensions that are just like staying with the wizard as, as, a, as you know, just as a friend mm -hmm. or something like that. A lot of times it's fun to incorporate like extra planar creatures in this sense, not as adversaries, not as part of a plot they have to, you know, suss out but just as color, background. Uh, yep. uh, someone that they could interact with if they wanted to, but it's not vital. Yeah. And so they can approach the fantastical element sort of on, on their own, but it, it, it's offered, you know. Yeah, they're, they're staying at the Swizzers Tower because they're like they getting diplomatic immunity or something from their dimension. Uh, right, you know? yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and if they yeah. leave this tower, they're going to get taken back. Yeah, exactly, right? It might be that these towers are the only places that extraplanar creatures that otherwise butt heads with each other can come and speak civilly, or maybe Wizards Towers are known as, as like a neutral ground for, uh, you know, the Blood War or something like that, where mm -hmm. emissaries from this demon and this devil, you know, we're just having a, some tea uh, yeah. right now. Uh, or something, or angels. A and game of chess. <laughs> and fiends Three and dragon angels. ante, whatever. <laughs> That's one. Those uh, those occupants were there willingly and, and are, represent potential friendly encounters with for the PCs. But servants of, of the, uh, you know, the master of the tower. Yeah. Both seen and one. unseen. Both seen and unseen, both magical and non-magical. And when you start really kind of thinking about it, you could easily have a, an eclectic mix of conjured constructs that handle like the menial labor and day-to-day -day tasks of the place and then like highly specialized um, you know, actual people who are there like, oh yes, I, I'm, you know, I, I take care of the wards uh, of the mm -hmm. place. It's my job to uh, attend to the warding glyphs uh, and the like, or, you and know. his beard trimmer. <laughs> right, his beard <laughs> trimmer, right. You know, like any of the, uh, if I was going to really like mine this for some silly stuff, you could look at like the court of Louis the Fourteenth or some of the other Louis before they all got there. 
That's cut off. Uh, and then and sort of see like, this is the person who opens this particular door for the king or wipes his bum with this particular cloth. And yeah. you can really get silly with the amount of uh, servants that a, a caster might have because maybe they're incredibly powerful, uh, old beyond uh, anyone's um, you know understanding and, yeah. and collected these sorts of servants. Definitely an on-site tailor. Maybe there's a huntsman, a groundskeeper, a master at arms, someone that attends to all the magical beasts that they've collected. Who else is gonna feed the griffins or mm -hmm. deal with the pet giant that we have out back, that kind of thing. Yeah, the master at arms would be like the smallest, whatever it was. Yeah. Little, little creature there. Like a little would pixie or something. Yeah, it would definitely be like a pixie or a quickling. <laughs> a quickling. Oh, yeah, you got a quickling master. <laughs> Those are people who are there, we'll say mostly willingly. Um, <laughs> mostly like, willingly. Right. You might also have summoned creatures who yeah. are bound to the place either in like a summoning circle or a, or a proper cage, or maybe it's just like they can't leave the grounds. Perhaps the, the arcane sanctum is literally a, a sanctuary of some kind for, you know, conjured creatures who are unable to get back home and you know you can't just have them running around so these mages uh, you know they just let them live here they're fine but uh, too much time away from their home has made them a little crazy let's not mm -hmm. talk to them uh, and and you're you know you're there more as caretakers than uh, you yeah. know like proper mages. All of those things you can feature in there and are again ways to impart information to the party. Uh, you know, they stumble across a, you know, a hemisphere of darkness, brightly glowing runes etched around the outside of it. They know that they found some kind of creature that doesn't want to be disturbed being bound in a summoning circle, but who's to say they can't just have a chat, a friendly conversation with it, you know? <laughs> yeah, what, what could go wrong? Just uh, take that uh, moat of dust over there and lay it over the rune. No one will be the wiser, you know? Um, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> Concentrate that kind of power, Jim. You know what happens. Uh, it, it brings up a concept in, in, in role-playing games that I like, which is the, the nega dungeon. The, the type of dungeon that you go into and the normal things that you would do in a dungeon, taking things, killing monsters, rummaging around, is going to get you not just, it's going to be bad for you personally, but also for the setting. Yeah. And so I like the idea of putting very powerful creatures bound in like summoning circles or magical prisons and the like and just putting them in the path of the players and being like, you could let them out if you wanted. They're certainly going to do everything they can to trick you into letting them out. It's a fun thing to put in there uh, along with maybe more mundane prisoners, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's where the king's nephew got up to. Yeah. <laughs> right? Oh, he's off at boarding school, honey. Don't worry. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> And so any number of, say, political prisoners, uh, inconvenient family members, mm -hmm. you know, exiles from foreign lands, uh, all of them could be found in uh, the dungeons and prisons of places like this, because who else to take care of these people but uh, these mages, right? Yeah, I mean, well, for a price, right? <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> Not just inhabitants, but like the particular like contents of things, the objects that you might find there. There's probably meditation chambers, summoning rooms, ritual magic uh, chambers. You might have um, all kinds of odd guest quarters, depending yeah, on bestiaries. who's. Bestiaries. Bestiaries, and those for uh, more aquatic persuasions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, an aviary of some kind for uh, the different flyers that you might mm -hmm. host there. Well, I'm seeing a, uh, a sanctum that is built at the confluence of all four elements and maybe just has like, uh, you know, you can, you can go to each of them if you go if you go north, you go to the air, south, mm -hmm. you go to earth, you know. And in the middle is all the mages that built the place, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. like sort of like a, a node type structure. Yeah. And that could be like, uh, you could have that because they're studying the different elements. And mm -hmm. now what began as like a research and observation location became a place where the creatures from these other planes like made first contact. Yeah. some kind and maintain you know like an ambassador uh, sort of relationship there or something there's a lot of different ways to play it out uh, great big summoning like rooms where there's gigantic you know creatures that are in the midst of moving between worlds and it takes a while, right? It's gonna take a week to bring this behemoth over uh, from where it is, but we need it. Yeah. Trust me, we need it. <laughs> Don't mess with it. <laughs> totally be worth it, trust me. Libraries of all sorts of outlandish and strange books, oh, yeah. uh, both forbidden and, and otherwise. That's just, that's like the magical, fantastical stuff. There's 
you know, more mundane you know, pantries and kitchens and rooms and halls and things like that you mm -hmm. find. So it's a place that can really come to life. And depending on whether it's like an active, like, you know, the, the original inhabitants are there, they're fulfilling the purposes of these structures kind of thing, or it's an old ruined place with the ghosts of the inhabitants and old spells that haunt the halls and no one's been here in ages. And what are we doing here again? Like, mm -hmm. it really, um, you can really tell an interesting story with that and and really contribute to your world and, and like showcase what makes it unique there's someone we've left out you know yeah the man at the top the 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 whole reason that this tower this sanctum has been built is who's building this thing like and what are they going to build what are they going to build it's obviously going to be determined by who's who's building it mm -hmm. a diviner is going to build a much different tower than a than an evoker or an abjurer. Certainly, certainly. So the mage themselves are is a big factor in a lot of this. And, and when you're thinking about these things, you know, maybe the mage is the first thing that kind of pops up. But you know, the personality of mm -hmm. the caster, how they wield magic, are are they a very demanding, iron willed kind of uh, figure? Are they uh, you know emotive and and and, and freewheeling in, in mm -hmm. their magic and and their discipline? Right, like all of that is going to factor into what kind of place this is. Is it it, uh, the abode of a long-lived caster, or, or one you know more shorter-lived, uh, maybe someone who practiced a particular kind of magic that was unique to them that's colored the place, or uh, one that's maybe more common and widespread, and therefore this location is quite coveted. Mm -hmm. uh, are they still there, or are they gone, and for what reason would they be gone? Uh, all of those things can help you both determine what you want to do with this location once you've actually created it, because presumably, you know, you're not just thinking all this stuff up for the hell of it. It's going to be either interacted with with players, or you're going to present it uh, mm -hmm. as, as part of your world. And so thinking through all of this is a way to, like, really add depth to these places and get them interested in exploring them because yeah. poking your head around this, this location is what makes the whole thing fun, right? Oh, it totally is. And I mean, and not only that, but everything we're talking about here, eventually one of those players who's a caster mm. is going to want to build a little bit of a sanctum of their own one day and settle down. Oh, sure. sure. And, and so not you, take one over themselves. Yeah, not take, I mean, well, I mean, they might. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, but, you know, all this information is 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 there for them as well. So you can you can build the best sanctum that you can have. The best sanctum, um, very very best sanctum. It, it, it's worth sort of thinking about like as you're presenting these things as game elements mm -hmm. that there is a there's a break point somewhere for your group where the outlandish, bizarre uh, kind of things or, or the, the depth and layers of traps and wards and guards and, and guardians that you've put on can be like, go from fun to frustrating, rarely, yeah. very quickly. Uh, and, and, and you know, as you're creating these things, you're sort of like a, a dungeon master or a world builder and you're like, oh man, of course it would have this and that and oh my God, it would be impossible to break into and oh, this is the perfect setting. Like thinking about about it in terms of its playability, mm -hmm. uh, of whether or not the playset and what you've created is, is conducive to play. It's something that you really should think about because oftentimes you create things in a world and it isn't until you present them to the players that you realize like, ooh, wait a minute, that seemed, that was like, fun when I was thinking about it and, and, and like, oh yeah, this wizard is awesome. Like, you're never gonna get the drop on him. And then like three hours into a session, the party feels stumped and you're like, Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure I did that with my Starbound crew with with, oh, yeah. with Zelos Wizard with the, Tower. Uh, with, yeah. um, with the glyph, the, uh, yeah, the, glyph well, checkerboard. <laughs> well, the glyph checkerboard, they got through that, but when they got to the uh, the stillborn Neogi that exists both in the ethereal and the prime material, and oh, they I, walk I, around I, on the web of thoughts that are in the room uh -huh. and uh, basically project your worst, like most hated enemy. Uh, so you attack it, but the whole thing is it's a psychic thing. So the second you attack it, you take the same amount of damage mm -hmm. until you figure out like, oh no, I need to be jumping through the fog to yeah. whatever's back 20 feet back mm -hmm. and not the thing that's right in front of me. Yeah, yeah. So you get like in a moment where yeah. the players are just, you'll get a player revolt eventually. Uh, they finally figured it out. <laughs> and we toss bottle, finally like, he's like, wait a minute, I think it's over there. Mm -hmm. And he, he misty stepped and saw it. It's and a little, little thing. tiny Neogi thing. And, you know, so that once they figured it out, but it was just like... Yeah, it, it's a fine line, right? Yeah. Like, you have to really know your group. And sometimes it might take a long time of playing together to figure out where that line is. And, yeah. and even then, even if you've been playing with people for years, where that line is in a given night is changes, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's just worth considering because it, 
I know for myself, I you know, in designing these things for all the different games that have played over the years, there have been plenty of times where I've been like, all right, after the sixth wall of force comes down and traps the party into eight, and, you know, you're just like, wait a second, <laughs> you know? You can let your imagination run wild to the point where it's no longer a thing to be played with and interacted with. Yeah, yeah. And I think keeping those things in mind, like it's fun to think of all the fantastical things you can do, but always remembering that when you're talking about a game, these are meant to be interacted with, meant to be played with and, and uh, explored, poked around and looked at, maybe not without consequence. Then that's a good way to make sure that you're gonna stay on that side of, of interesting and fun Mm -hmm. And if you start towing the lineup into frustration, there's ways that you can scale that back. And, yeah. and you know, or you know, every night of your players, just like aha moment comes through and it goes from frustrating to fun. Right, you right. You know, it, it's a part of the nature of the game. But yeah, but, but the big thing is to never forget that these are opportunities to <coughs> enrich your world with, with, with the magical, with the fantastical. Uh, and you know, hopefully they go poking around in your, in your sanctum. Yes, have a great time. <laughs> head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. I'm familiar with the concept of like AI gods and people interpreting uh, technical processes as spells and rituals. Not particularly Gene Wolfe's uh, series, although I, I know that the, the new Sun series is, is uh, you know, like heavily inspired Numenera and mm -hmm. some other kind of science fantasy stuff. I think my favorite iteration of it is probably in, I don't know, a weird module, the anomalous subsurface environment, uh, where it's like these orbital gods and AI platforms communicate with priests down on the ground through like monitors and things like that. And that's how they sort of interpret their uh, their signs. I had a setting that I never used. I developed it for a while. A lot, parts of it made it into Land Between Two Rivers, but I never ran a game in it where it was like part of an intergalactic civilization, right? And it's like a, a pleasure planet or something like that, and it goes dark. The uh, whatever intergalactic networks of communication and travel it was it was a part of disintegrate, and it's just by itself. Oh, it's like Shades of Tecumel, uh, if you're familiar with that one. But this one was distinctly like. There's, there are these uh, AI that orbit the planet in, in satellites and now they're cut off from their other AI and they slowly descend into madness and insanity just because they don't get the regular updates and you know those kinds of things. And Drop over a centuries. zero here or one there. Uh -huh. and, and like you know the, the people who were able to communicate with and, and uh, you know interact with those satellites, uh, you know they controlled like the weather on the planet, they controlled you know, oh, all yeah. these kinds of things. Right? Oh yeah, when Ryza went dark it was never pretty. It was never pretty and so they had, they had them like sort of embedded in them as sort of like machines that were in them so it would appear as spell casting but, it would, but you know wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just accessing the program codes of these AIs that control various things through super science and things. So yeah, I, I like that, that uh, you know, that, that setup. It's very, very fun. I'm pretty, pretty sure fun. there was an original series episode about that. Definitely a no, Futurama I, episode. Definitely a Futurama episode, yeah. You're, you're gonna do like 40K is that way, right? Like what's a machine spirit other than an AI, right? Yeah. Like that's how I see the machine spirit. They are, I, mean, I know that in 40K AI are like, you know, heresy, but I just feel like they're probably too stupid to realize that they're surrounded by AI. <laughs> it's really only yeah. these few that they, you know, whatever, <laughs> call heretech. Heretech. So, yeah. <laughs>